participation. It's not very efficient um, compared well, let, to Let's explore that for a moment. Victoria, do you have uh, Raphael's slides? Put up his uh, first slide here, because as, a, <coughs> as someone who studied mathematics poorly, um, the understanding that I had was that as you go, say, say you're looking at the coastline of, of, of uh, Massachusetts, and you're looking at it from a satellite, and you, you, you see one line, but then you come closer, and then you begin to trace every little indentation, and then you even get closer, and you trace even any more indentation, and try to specify down to the m atomic level that the amount of information in the line that traces the coastline is actually unbounded and infinite. Um, what is it that you've discovered? Well, that it's not. It's not infinite. There's a limit. Um, and so how, and, does this, and, how do we begin but, but, but with this picture here? I, I think that's one important thing that maybe we need to say in order to get from the black holes to this. Sure. Um, I, I was actually not part of this debate with Hawking. I became his student two years later. Um, but you looked younger as a result. I as think a result, it's, yes. It's certainly, um, it's certainly aged these gentlemen yeah, yeah, yeah. here. So I, 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 I you know. Incidentally, the reason we're ordered this way is we came in, we figured Raphael could walk the furthest. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, and we decided we're just going to leave you here when we... Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> good. and Hawking couldn't be here, so you got me, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was here last year. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so, so, so these gentlemen had, you know, the, the crazy insight that um, when, when information is dropped into a black hole, it is not, in fact, lost. Even though naively you would just think, okay, now it's in this black hole. It's somewhere, but we can't get to it. They insisted that you still have to be able to get to it, which, you know, Lenny made it sound so easy, but it, it wasn't that obvious. It was an incredible intuition. And, um, and for that to be true, for that to be true that if you throw a phone book into a black hole, that later on you can figure out whether it was the New York or Chicago phone book. Two amazing things have to happen. Uh, first of all, Hawking had to be wrong um, <laughs> about, about the idea that, that no matter what you throw into the black hole, the same thing comes out. It's a very loose way of putting what he said, but, but that's, the, the, that, that's the basic way information would be lost. Um, a second amazing thing had to happen, uh, which is, it, you know, it takes a long time for a black hole to fizzle away and disappear and return potentially return information to you supposing Hawking is wrong. And in the meantime, you've got this big fat black hole sitting there. And what had to be true was that while the big fat black hole is sitting there, that that black hole itself contains information while it's still sitting there and hasn't fizzled away yet. All right, so the and question for that to be true, there had to be a limit on how much information there could possibly be in the region that was occupied by the black hole, because you could presumably always convert that region into a black hole. All right, so let's, let's back up for a second. Um, so, so Hawking suggests that the information is gone. Uh, you say that can't possibly be true. Hawking says rubbish. <laughs> and then you go about saying, well, no, we're going to find where that information actually is. Leonard, where, and before we get to uh, uh, Raphael's slide here, um, where did you find, or where did we find that that information that Hawking says is gone in the black hole is actually stored? Okay, so one of the things that we found is, I'm sorry to say this, John, but that turned out to be a bad question. Okay. That in a certain sense, bits of information don't necessarily have locations or at least they don't necessarily have locations which are objective and the same for everybody, no matter how they're moving. Okay, hey, I'm all the about notion, that question. The notion of a bit of information is a good one. We believe it, we believe distinctions exist and distinctions persist. But the notion of where that bit of information is located turned out not to be a good, what a physicist would call invariant question. It might depend on who was looking at it. Now, let me give you an example of where it is a good idea. If an atom decays inside the sun, everybody will agree it happened inside the sun. It doesn't matter if you're moving relative to the sun, it doesn't matter if you're far away, if you're nearby, everybody will agree if they do the calculation, they see what comes out, they'll agree. The atom decayed inside the sun, if the thing happened inside the sun. Black holes are different. And what we found out is the whole notion of whether something happens inside a black hole or if it happens just above the surface of the black hole, the surface meaning the horizon, is a question which is observer-dependent. Somebody who falls into the black hole may have all of the experiences of seeing the event happen 
well in past the horizon, somebody standing outside the black hole will reconstruct out of the Hawking radiation that that event actually happened outside the black hole. So the answer to your question is we didn't find out where the information was. We found out that it was an improper question, that bits of information don't really have locations in that sense. And how do you know they weren't destroyed if you couldn't find them in a particular location? Well, eventually, eventually a lot of the power of string theory and other mathematics came to bear on it and confirmed that uh, there was no expectation that it would be destroyed. But as, uh, can I call you Gerard? It's so much yes. easier. Okay. <laughs> as my friend Gerard here says, I spent years learning to say Gerard, but I, never mind. I'm totally fine with Gerard. Yeah. I'm totally anyway. fine with it. <laughs> God, I'm 70 years old, 71 years old, and I forgot what I was going to say. Um, no, no, but you, you, were, you, you were saying that, uh, uh, that the, the issue of where it was and the invariance of, of, of the question meant that, or, or the, the, the variance of my question meant that, y you know, you wanted to basically change the nature of the inquiry. Yeah, right, but you asked me how we know, and I think the answer was given by Gerard, that so much would break down in physics. The whole structure of everything we know about physics would break down and disintegrate if even you open the door a tiny little bit for the idea of information to be lost. Once it can be lost, you can promote that and make it worse and worse and worse and worse, and eventually the whole structure of physics as we know it uh, will break down. There are some things you can't have a little bit of. You either have it or you don't. You know, we all know about pregnancy, but, uh, but uh, let me give you another example. In mathematics, can you have a theory, a, th a theory which means a mathematical structure, arithmetic or whatever, can you have a theory which is approximately consistent? It's almost completely consistent, okay? Well, you might have some structure, some set of axioms, and you derive, you, you let your computer run and derive 10,000 uh, theorems from it, and it say, oh, it's approximately consistent. Only four of them were inconsistent with each other. Well, no, a mathematician would come and tell you, once you have any inconsistency, you can use that inconsistency to promote, uh, to promote it to anything is inconsistent with everything else, basically. I think the same thing was true about information loss. Once you had it, once you had it in any form at all, you could imagine situations where it would undermine basically all of physics. And that's what, uh, I think that's what Gerard thought, that's what I thought, and it's what Stephen didn't think. So uh, we sort of battled uh, our heads against the wall for a while. All right, so how, in my imperfect uh, question-creating way, can, can we get to the point of either, if, if not where was the information, how did we learn conclusively that it wasn't destroyed and that if the phone book went into the singularity, that uh, there was a way to find out if it was Chicago or Amsterdam or, you know, Soweto. Uh, whenever I encounter a situation like this, I try to approach it from all possible angles, particularly the angles that my neighbors here would not be prepared to look at, to see what can be done. We have, a, as I said, a paradox here, and the resolution must come from a totally different point of view than previously. Now, one thing was that quantum mechanics was used to derive the result, and quantum mechanics somehow failed to, be, to agree with the pi final result, there was something wrong. So my attitude was, we start from the other end. Now, now let's assume that the black hole as a whole agrees with every, anything we know about quantum mechanics. That means information in is equal to information out. It's that simple, basically, in a quantum mechanical sense. So that ought to be true. As soon as you believe that this is true, it's a relatively simple calculation to find how much information there is in the black hole. And you do that calculation, you find the amount of information in the black hole is exactly equal to its surface area. It's like putting bits and bytes of a computer memory on the surface. Every bit, every byte of information occupies a very precise amount of surface, which, which you can cal calculate relatively easily. And that 
tells you big black holes contain lots of information, small ones contain a little information, still enormous amounts in any absolute sense. But that was a very clear conclusion, how much information there is in the black hole. But the question where the information is, is something else again. All right, but let, let me just uh, back up here. So, so all you got, if you got your black hole, uh, to study, at least not to find where the information is, but to, to figure out if there is a, a quantity of information that yes. could be sufficient to no. specify what goes on in this black hole. You've got your Not surface. Not just sufficient, the exact quantity itself. Exact, OK. okay. There, there's a few bits hanging around the side. But that, apart from that, uh, the total quantity of information is very precisely calculable. But, you, but, but all you've got is the surface of the black hole. Yes. And, and, and so you've got to test, could there be enough information on the surface to specify what's gone into this singularity and what's happening beyond this event horizon? That's the question, right? Well, the question was answered by this assumption that the black hole should obey quantum mechanics. Once you make that assumption, you find that not only the information of things that went in and out of the black hole, but everything is in its vicinity should be mapped onto its surface in bits and bytes. It's like saying that the surface is a hologram of the immediate surrounding space-time. Uh -huh. So a, a x-dimensional object can specify an x plus one dimensional Precisely. object. Mm -hmm. yes. Are you getting it? And that this was here? Is this working for you? <laughs> We're cool, right? All right, all right, good. You're all with us. Okay. So the surface <laughs> is two-dimensional, so but is the two surrounding space-time is three-dimensional. Which is exactly what a hologram does. You got your two-dimensional Star Wars movie and your three-dimensional looking Princess Leia, who, by the way, did have a prom date, I believe. Uh, and, and, and so, is, but is that an illusion? You know, in perspective, it's basically, you're, you're creating an illusion, or is it actually a one-to-one -one mapping of all the information of the reality onto the 2D surface that gives you your 3D reality? Herman? Yeah, again, uh, talking about the mapping, then we don't know exactly how that mapping works at this point. But I would say that, that the thing, the, the principle that turns out to be very p powerful in this context, I call it the Rumsfeld principle. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's basically saying, well, it's better to deal with known unknowns than with unknown unknowns. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so he was bad at all of them, by the yeah, way. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the, the unknown unknowns are stuff that you lose and you don't know that you lost it. Uh, if you throw something in a black hole, for all practical purposes, purposes, you've lost it. You've lost the information. But what we're talking about is actually that, I, that we know that we lost it. Again, I don't remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday, but I, I knew I had breakfast. So at least I know how much information I lost by having a bad memory. <laughs> uh, and so, so the fact that we could quantify how much information is in the black hole, and that it's measured by the area, that turned out to be the, surprisingly, the, the key insight. So knowing how to quantify what you don't know uh, is, ah. is, a, is, a deep, is a deep principle. All right, I think, yeah, I, I, that, that's actually starting to work for me. Let's, let's forget your slides, Raphael, for the moment, if you don't mind, <laughs> and go to Leonard's slide, which really gets us from this idea of there's a bunch of information and it maps into something that we might think of as a three-dimensional image. Victoria, can you put uh, Leonard's first slide up? Okay, what is this? This one. Uh, that's a microscopic picture of the film of a hologram, which in fact I made up myself with uh, Microsoft Paint, so it's a fake. But it's about what it would look like. It's about what, if you look through the microscope, at the film, not the thing that is being described by the hologram, but by the piece of film itself, it would look approximately like that. And uh, so then if you put light no. through it in some okay. particular way. Right, well, let's, let's first, it's got some information in it. It's all yep. scrambled. It's impossibly yep. scrambled. You can't look at this and see what, the, what it is. Anybody, any guesses what the, yeah. the image guesses? is there? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> what? Leonard Susskind, oh, uh, exactly good. Donald Rumsfeld. Guess down here. <laughs> okay, great. So it is, it is a fake. Uh, uh, anyone say puppy? Anyone say puppy? A little horsey? Uh, no, no horsies. Okay, all right. Let's see. 
Well, okay, go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Here's here's the stand by, folks. All right. This is another fake. I also drew that myself. All right. All right. So if you do the right thing with a hologram, namely shine light on it and so forth, it'll reconstruct an image. So the the, the you got the flashlight. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe this is obvious, but right. the flashlight going right. through the film, but, and somehow the the yeah. information it, it, uh, t in the film recreates the 3D image yeah. of the clown smoking right. the cigar. But that's the, right. But the interesting thing about it is that the clown is three-dimensional. You can go behind it, and you can see whether he has hair on the back of his head. You can go underneath and look at the chin underneath. In fact, if this hologram had been made not with ordinary light, but if it had been made by uh, an NMR scan, you could have coded on that boundary, on that uh, surface, you could have the interior, you could have all your guts and blood and everything else, bones. The entire full three-dimensional structure would have been mapped. You used the word mapped, and it's a good word mapped onto the boundary, onto the film. Uh, and the important thing is not that you shine light to reconstruct it, but that the information about the clown is equally well, and in fact, in some sense, better described, more accurately described, more precisely described by the uh, little dots and dashes and uh, structures <coughs> that are entirely scrambled, totally impossible for you to just look at, but it's there, it's there in that film. It's there. and, and yeah. As you say, you can add detail to that informational film infinitely, or is there an upper limit? Okay. So, in the world that we're talking about, which is the real world, there's a limit. No more than one bit, and that means a plus or a minus, one little dot per Planck area. The Planck area is a certain unit of area that's made up out of the fundamental constants of nature, it happens to be about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters on a side. It's far smaller than anything that physics studies experimentally, but no more. Where'd it go? It disappeared. Uh, okay, black hole, I, something. Yeah, they went in the black hole. <laughs> yeah. No more than one bit, that means a black dot or a white dot, per Planck area. All right, That's so let, let's just back, back that up for a second. Um, just as you need a certain amount of resolution on a piece of standard film or a digital CCD chip to produce an image that's recognizable of your lovely pets or your kids or right. something like that. Uh, in physics, one bit of information, is it a traditional bit as though? Yes, it's a yes or no question. A yes or no uh, question, so, so down, a zero or one, or a zero or one bit yeah. Yeah, zero one. Is, is necessary uh, to specify a Planck space, which is an infinitesimal but measurable uh, a little chunk of space. Well, beyond our ability to measure at the present, but yes. All right. Uh, and so what it says, I mean, in, in, in essence, what it says is this entire room, everything that's in it, can be in principle described mathematically in terms of degrees of freedom, structures on the boundaries, on the walls of the room, with never needing more than one bit of information per Planck area. That was very radical. That was very surprising because people had always associated information with volume. We have another picture, but uh, maybe you want to go around. For well, let's go. No, let's let's go to uh, okay. this is the pixel. The pixels and the voxels. Okay, let's do the uh, pixel voxel. That's the next two slides. Sure Victoria. Which come up first. First, the uh, pixels. All right. This is a, right. obviously a two D. Can we jump? Can we jump to the other one first? All right. Let's, let's do the, do the one. voxels we'll do the first. first. Okay. All right. There's the room. If you like, there's the room. And I'm going to describe the room, everything that's in the room, by dividing it up into little tiny cells. A cell, let's say, no bigger than an atom. And what can we ask about a cell? We can ask, is there or isn't there an atom in it? Of course, we can ask what type of atom, but let's ignore that. Is there or isn't there an atom in it? And if we didn't have to worry about the type of the atom, that would be a complete description of everything that's in the room. And so there would be one decision for each voxel, a voxel is a word that means a little cube, there would be one bit of information per voxel. It's either empty or it's full. All right, so we've divided up this room uh, in, in, in each Planck space. Well, I, I was talking about atoms, but yes. All right, for, in, in right. each bigger than a Planck space that we've decided to choose, right. we're asking the question, is there an atom in there? And there's a yes or a no answer to that. And we right. reconstruct the entire space in right. information terms in, information. in a cube like this. Right. And we got someplace there are atoms, someplace there's not. I would say in this room would probably be a lot of yeses, probably, right? More, many more no's than yeses. You think? 
Oh, oh yeah, well, that's the room right. is space empty. is mostly empty. Yeah. yeah, the room is almost all empty space. It always it annoys me but, uh, to hear that yeah. always, but yeah. yeah. Well, um, anyway, okay, so so now right. now that's the 3D. Yeah. So what's yeah. the other picture? Well, what we found in essence is that's too much information. No room can ever have as much information as is implicit in this picture here. The amount of information that it takes to describe the room is more like this picture here. One bit of information per, per surface area. So I like to say the world is pixelated, not voxelated. The world is made up, or the degrees of freedom of the world, the most accurate description we can ever have is in terms of a number of degrees of freedom, which is proportional to the area and not the volume. So it's actually the reverse of our intuition. And Very much. Gerard, uh, help me out here. So we like to think of, uh, gosh, you know, movies are great, but wouldn't it be fabulous to, to have IMAX 3D? In fact, what physics says is you can get all the information in your 3D high-res reality world on a 2D surface. Let me just, one thing before I want to get these guys. Yeah, yeah. The only thing is that the two-dimensional description is going to be monstrously scrambled, very difficult to decode, very difficult to see what it's a picture of. That's the, that's the cost of coding information in two dimensions instead of three. Right. As a mathematician, your first reaction will be there's much less space on right. a two-dimensional surface than in a three-dimensional world. So your first reaction is that can't be right. We will be missing enormous amounts of information if we try to put, scramble everything on a surface. However, you have to remember that this is the Planck length, which is extremely small to for all standards. 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is extremely tiny, even in units of elementary particles. So even this looks at first sight to be very little information. Actually, it is enormous. It's gigantic. But on the other hand, you have to realize that not only what's in this room should be mapped on the surface, but the entire universe can be mapped on the surface. That's even more gigantically crazy, because you would think that the surface of the universe would be much smaller than its volume. But again, these Planck units are so small that still you have enough information on the surface to specify everything that goes on in the universe. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's so counterintuitive. I mean, every time I go into the Holland Tunnel, I wonder how all of New York could fit in here. But in <laughs> fact, that's kind of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so it is very, very counterintuitive. A so so you, you, you come up with these.